Okay, the reason why the thing about olive oil is not correct is that if you look at the whole world of fats and oils, there are only two things that you have to get from them. So welcome to this episode of Growth Island. Today I got an amazing guest on. He is, there's many ways to introduce him. I've been talking to him for a while now and uh, I can already feel I have this good feeling in my body when you talk to someone where you feel like we could be speaking for hours and I know I have to be cautious in this interview that uh, we're not going to go off too many tandems because uh, there's so many things to talk about in life, but he's an expert on many things. And one of the things that he first got known for is oils. He might be thinking about oils, but why oils? Well, it has a big effect. He sold over 250,000 books. He uh, wrote the book, Fat That Heal, Fat That Kill, which is something that more people are becoming aware of. He has been sharing the stage with my big hero, Tony Robbins, and he's been doing more than 3,000 media appearances. He looks like he is like 50, 60 something. He told me he's going to turn 80 soon. So whatever he's doing is definitely working. So I'm pretty excited about having Udo Erasmus on the show. Udo, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, I'm glad, glad to be on. This will be fun. Udo, just, I read about of your, I read about how you've been evolving uh, since you were a small kid and so on. Can you give us kind of like the, the quick intro for you actually being born at the Second World War? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, my parents came from Latvia and Estonia. We have German, Swedish background <clears throat> and they left Latvia because when Hitler and Stalin made their non-aggression pact, Latvia went to the Soviet Union and part of Poland went to Germany. Now there was nobody from Latvia or Poland at the meeting. They just took it because they were big and they could. And my parents grew up, they in, in Latvia and Estonia under communism and they loved the Russian people, but they hated communism because communism took everything away from everybody and everything became state owned and you became a servant to the state and they didn't like it. So they went to Poland, which was then part of Germany and ended up leaving a farm in Latvia and getting given a farm in Poland and the farmer who owned the farm became my father's farmhand on his own farm. And for a while it was a little tense. So says my dad, cause I don't remember it. And he said, well, look at, I don't like this war stuff any better than you do. Let's just run the farm the way a farm needs to be run and let's work together and, and see how it sorts out. And then they became friends. And then when the war ended, we headed out, we in the direction of Germany with the communists chasing us in tanks and trucks and the allies, which we always like to think of as the good guys, they were shooting at us from planes using refugees as target practice. There's mostly women with young children on horse drawn hay wagon on dirt roads, no military presence whatsoever. And so my mother went through the fields. It was in winter and she had six kids with her. She couldn't handle six kids walking through the fields, but it was safer in terms of get, not getting shot at and not, and the trucks and tanks weren't chasing people through the fields. They were just chasing them on the roads. So she left four kids behind. I was one of the kids left behind and eventually it's a long story, but eventually we got reunited. Her sister went and, and got us out from where we had been left. And so we got reunited, but the whole thing. I just remember being very shy and nervous and yeah, I just was very, I love books because in books you can read a book about war, but there's no bullets flying. No, that's a already new bullets flying. So books are safe. Yeah. So I, I did a lot of reading and became very interested in understanding things. And when I was six years old, I said, I, I heard people arguing about trivial things to me as a six year old, they were trivial. And this thought came to me, it's like. There must be a way that human beings can live in harmony and I'm going to find out how. And that became my driver for my life. That's why I went into science to understand how things work, then into biosciences, how creatures work, then into psychology, how thinking works. Those are all good things to understand if you want to know how to live in harmony, right? Then I went into medicine to, to learn about health, but I found out it's only about disease. They don't have a real definition of health. They say health is. You're healthy when you're not sick mm. and actually you're sick when you're not healthy. Health is the principle and there are components 
And so I left medicine, went back into bio biological sciences, biochemistry, genetics, <clears throat> because that's where you learn about health. You're studying normal creatures in normal situations, doing normal things. And so then I left university because I didn't find what I was looking for. Eventually I got into self-knowledge because I needed to understand how I work. Mm -hmm. And so that ba is basically my background. And then you're one of the pioneers when it came to flex oil. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what happened was I got poisoned by pesticides. I got a, my, my marriage broke up and I wanted to kill something. I was really upset. So I took a job as a pesticide sprayer because pesticides kill things, right? So I, I, I had that job for three years and I was really careless and I got poisoned by pesticides. Went to the doctor, said, what do you have for pesticide poisoning? She said, nothing. And that day it became really clear to me that my health is my responsibility. So then I went into the research journals to talk, to look at health and nutrition, disease and nutrition, to try and figure out what I could improve to get myself better and got stuck on fats and oils because they were the most confusing area, contradictory, <clears throat> misrepresented, very sensitive to damage, treated, they should be treated with the greatest care of all nutrients. They're actually treated with the least care because we throw them in the frying pan mm. and turn them into smoke. And you know that you're damaging molecules. But when an oil turns into smoke, you know you haven't got oil anymore. But and so the thing with, with fats yeah. and oils as well, like you have, I've heard about olive oil being one of the kind of almost a medicine, but that you shouldn't, and I used to use it on the frying pan, but then I read uh, Mark Hyman's, uh, what the hell should I eat? Yeah, Where he he writes about like it actually doesn't do too well at high temperatures. Then something like coconut oil is better. And I saw that you wrote a blog post about coconut oil not being everything it's being praised to be. So what are the oils uh, to use, and in, when do you use a different kind of oils? Okay, the reason why the thing about olive oil is not correct is that if you look at the whole world of fats and oils, there are only two things that you have to get from them. One is called omega-6, and that was known to be an essential nutrient back in 1929. And the other one is omega-3, which omega-3 was established as being essential in 1981. That was the year after I got poisoned. And I had my head in the journals looking for what I could do. And I found out that omega-3 is essential, which means you can't make it in the body. You have to have it to, be, to live and be healthy. It has to come in from outside. If you don't get enough, you can't stay healthy and your health deteriorates. And if you don't get enough long enough, you die. Mm. This is like the, the cornerstone building blocks for body construction, right? And if you're going down because you're not getting enough, but you bring enough back into the diet before you die, then all the symptoms of not getting enough are reversed because life knows how to make a body that works provided we take responsibility to make sure that all of the essential building blocks land in our bodies so life can use them to do that job. And that includes 18 minerals, 13 vitamins, eight essential amino acids from proteins, and the two essential fatty acids from fat, so omega-3 and omega-6. That's the only thing you need from oils, that you find them in oils more than in fats. And that's the only thing you need. Everything else your body can make out of sugar and starch. So <clears throat> there's something about the balance as well of how much we make a three and yeah, yeah. six. And a lot of yeah. people are getting a lot more of one kind. So we're talking about right. like, how do you get more healthy fats, right? The right. From oils. Yeah. So, so omega-6 is found in almost all oils. One of the reasons why coconut is not a good oil because it has almost no omega-6 in it and it has no omega-3s in it. Olive oil has only 10% omega-6, but no omega-3, like less than 1%. That's why these, both of these are not great oils from the perspective of health. And omega-3 and 6 are damaged by light, by oxygen, by heat. So they should never be used for frying. <clears throat> and they need to be made with health in mind. But the industry has always just made them with shelf life in mind. Mm. And in the process to get the shelf life, they do damage to these oils. So if we can just go into that, because I, what I've been reading and how I understood it 
is mm-hmm. that for olive oil, it needs to be the right quality. So extra virgin, uh, organic olive oil, and it needs to be contained in the right way in the right kind of glass so it doesn't oxidize and many other things. Mm-hmm. But if you do put that on your food, that it is really healthy for you. And some people are looking at testing it more for having more therapeutic uh, effects. And yeah. For example, if you put it on your vegetables, you will absorb the vitamins and minerals better from the greens. So is that true or is that? Yeah, partly true. There are two issues with oils. One is what are the ingredients? And the second one is what is the processing? Mm. The reason why extra virgin olive oil has a good reputation is not because of what contains, but it's made without damage. The way olive oil is made, they squeeze the flesh and they float off the oil on water. <clears throat> the way other oils are made, they're tra- treated with sodium hydroxide, then they treat it with phosphoric acid, then they're bleached with bleaching clays, which turns them rancid. Now they smell bad. Now they have to be heated to frying temperature to clean them up. <clears throat> and in that processing, about 1% of the molecules are damaged. And when they're damaged, they don't fit into the biological architecture. And then they become monkey wrenches into the works. And that's why oils, when they're damaged, cause more health problems than any other part of nutrition. Hmm. And why making oils with health in mind is the most effective way to improve health. Actually, more important to do that change with oils than even to sugar. White sugar is also pretty bad, yeah. obviously. Right? So, so. <clears throat> yeah, so so the, the reason why extra virgin olive oil has a good reputation is because it isn't damaged by the processing, unlike almost all of the other oils, unless they say unrefined on the bottle. And it, they should be in glass because plastic swells <clears throat> when you put oil in it and then plastic leaches into oils. And there's good research on that that shows you put a, a plastic film on food, the plastic will leach into the food in direct proportion to the amount of fat or oil in that food. Okay. But that makes like, I think we're figuring out more and more that things are much better in glass than in plastic. So I just want to- Especially for oils. Yeah. Okay. And that makes interesting. So just to get it right, because there's a, so extra uh, virgin olive oil, (laughs) extra virgin Virgin olive oil, oils, uh, are good because of the way they are processed? Yes. Or you would still, okay, because... But, they, but they're not very good because they don't have omega-3 and 6. If that's <laughs> but what at you're optimizing you... for. Because it also has other things, right? Because otherwise my next question would... But at least you're not getting toxic stuff. Yeah. But you must also be oh, getting some positive stuff. Otherwise, my question would be, what have all these doctors, scientists and so on that advocates for olive oil, what have they misunderstood? because they should be able to understand the basics that like how much omega-3 and how much omega-6. So it must be something else that they see that olive oil has of uh, good benefits. Or what do you think they've misunderstood? Yeah, it, just- well, well, there, there are several things going on here. One of them is that the olive oil is not refined. So there are minor ingredients in it that are helpful to health. And, they, and oils do improve the absorption of oil-soluble nutrients. <clears throat> that are very good for health from foods. So that's why using oils with food makes, makes some sense. <clears throat> but there's also a lot of commercial cheating going on. And that commercial cheating comes from olive oil is pretty stable. Coconut oil is pretty stable. The more omega-3 oil has, the more sensitive to damage it is. And omega-3 is five times more sensitive to damage than the omega-6. So when you're dealing with omega-3s and 6s, you're dealing with perishable food and they need refrigeration and they need to be protected from light and you can't use them for frying. And it's a pain in the butt to have to do that. And most people who are in business don't want to have to take that kind of care of the products that they make. Mm. So they use whatever is convenient for them, even though it's not as good for you. And that's, I mean, in that industry, there is so much cheating goes on. Even the olive oil, they dilute it with canola oil sometimes or soybean oil, which are cheap. And they do that because olive oils grow slower than the demand for olive oil has. 
over the past 15, 20 years. I read, I think it was in Dr. Hyman's book as well. Yeah. That, and I might misrepresent the numbers, but that the industry of um, faking olive oil, uh, and like you're saying, is almost bigger than the industry of cocaine. Yeah. Uh, because it's such a big industry to fill in crap. Yeah. Instead, that are much cheaper, which yeah. is easy to think about. Yeah, that's so you have to know who you're talking to and you have to know what your sources are. Yeah. And that's not easy because everybody's a good storyteller. I mean, I'm telling you a story. You, you don't know if my story is true, <clears throat> right? Sounds convincing. I can go anywhere with in that, in that territory, but you don't know if I'm not making up something. Humans that's why are very good storytellers. And if they have an agenda, the story, the, the, the bigger the agenda is, the, the better the story gets. <laughs> for sure. Sometimes. I like to mm -hmm. often ask for studies and understanding either like what are the studies saying and also what are the underlying principles. And I know studies often sometimes, yeah. especially yeah. with pharma, we know a lot of them are paid for. We know there was like the studies with sugar and so on, Coca-Cola has been caught in like paying and so on. So that's why I'm super curious about the yeah. olive oil, because I understand your principle of saying like you want omega-6 and omega-3. That makes sense from like a biological perspective. Mm -hmm. What I'm just thinking is that there mm -hmm. must be something more in olive oil since so many people are advocating for it, because that principle is fairly simple, that it, you can read up on how much omega-6 and omega-3 are in it, right? So I'm thinking if it's just that it's so stable, then it's good for uh, eating together with uh, vegetables, so you observe them better, observe them better, observe them better. Or like, mm -hmm. um, is that then the Absorb. thing? Absorb them better. Absorb them better. Is that the only thing you would say uh, olive oil really got going for it? Yeah, and it has no toxicity in it other than maybe a little bit of rancidity. Yeah. And it has the, mi we call them the minor ingredients that yeah. you find in oils <clears throat> and extra virgin olive oil is the only oil that still contains its minor ingredients because they're taken out for a longer shelf life when you're talking about liquid oils that have a short shelf life. Yeah. So, so, but in terms of, but again, if it's true and it is true that only omega-3 alpha linolenic acid and omega-6 linoleic acid for health and all extra virgin olive oil is a poor source of both of them. Yeah. So you can use, and by the way, traditionally it was not used for frying. They cooked their foods in water, they dumped the water off, they put the oil on after. And it's, uh, the other thing is for flavor, because oils enhance flavors, but any oil will do that. Mm. So you enhance, enhance flavors and improve absorption of oil soluble nutrients. <clears throat> and the big thing is it's not damaged. If, if, if you're really getting extra virgin olive oil, it is not damaged by the processing because the way it's made is different from all of the oils on the shelves in the plastic bottles. And yes, it should be in glass. I would never buy olive oil in plastic. And I, this is one of the problems as far as I understand often with eating out is they often use shitty oils from plastic. And I don't know all the names of like all these oils that are supposed to be really, really bad but that are being used in these big plastic containers at many restaurants. Yeah. Well, and in the restaurants they're used for deep frying. So you put them in a vat and you're boiling the oil, then you put food in it and burn it, and then you pull it out. And all the talk <clears throat> comes out with the food <laughs> that, that the oil covers, right? And yeah. then you eat the, you eat the, the broken stuff. And then the, the research is very clear. When you fry oils, you increase risk of inflammation and cancer. And when you burn foods with oils, you, whether it's starch or protein or the oil itself, all three of them increase inflammation and increase risk of cancer because of the damage you're doing to molecules, turning them from something natural that the body understands and can work with into something unnatural that never existed in nature that therefore gums up the works. So what are some of the oils that we should use and what should we be frying our, or not frying, but cooking our food with? <laughs> okay. When I was a kid, cooking meant preparing food in water. And the other thing was called fry. And I just watched you how the term has changed. When we talk about cooking now, we're usually talking about fry. So the use of the word cooking has changed. Okay. If you, if health is your goal, you should not fry anything. Fried 
oils fry health and fried foods fry health. That's been known. There's so much research on that. Barbecuing and burning food, wh whichever way you do it, you can put it on a grill and, and fry it and burn it that way. Or you could put it in a frying pan. And what happens is the food is wet, but on the outside, because the temperature is so high, the water is evaporated and then it dries out and then it burns. And the burnt part is absolutely toxic for you. There's no way around that. And people say, oh yeah, but I love the taste of burnt food. You don't, no, you don't. If you scrape that stuff off, you got a tablespoon and you started eating it, crunching it up. It squeaks between your teeth, like chalk on a blackboard. <clears throat> it's acrid, it's bitter and it tastes disgusting, but we're so used to wolfing down our food and we got it with mother love because the industry, uh, told our mothers that frying was better than cooking in water because it was faster and women were busy. And the industry at that time, people would say, oh, the industry would never tell us to do anything that was bad for us. So they, we had a lot of faith in industry. The faith is unwarranted. And I think we live in a time where that's being shown for industry after industry, after industry, after industry, they were live for money. And that's basically, I think is the issue. Either you're, uh, it's like life is the treasure on the planet. But we have made money more important hmm. than life in a lot of ways. So let me understand this, right? You say yeah. that when we cook, let's say we're uh, cooking a chicken breast or a steak yeah. or something on a pan, then we should pour some water into the pan and put uh, the chicken breast on top or, but definitely not like a coconut oil or something else. We should just put some water in. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So, so yeah, then you cook it in water. And then you take it out and you put it on your plate. Then you can put oil on it. Okay. So you add the oil after the food comes off the heat. And that's the way olive oil was used in, in traditionally. Yeah. And Most that's of my health friends also only use olive oil, uh, not for cooking, but for putting on the food afterwards. Anyone yeah. that I know that is interested in health, they use coconut oil for the pan because it has a higher boiling point or whatever you call it. Like no, it doesn't. Uh, no, it doesn't. That's what we've been told. A guy, there was a guy who wrote a book <clears throat> about coconut. This is probably 15 years ago. He made every claim for coconut that can be leg legitimately made for omega-3s on the basis of existing research. And when I read the book, I was shocked. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. He's really saying that. And I've been steeped in this for 40 years, right? Yeah. And not a lot gets by me when it comes to fats. So what I decided to do is like, okay, he says it helps with cardio and it helps with this and it helps with, I went into Medline, the big database and looked for research on every claim he made. There was not a single claim for which I could find research that supported his statement, not a single one, but it became very popular. And again, why it became popular is I can put coconut under my bed for two years hmm. and then take it out. And it'll still be okay because it's mostly saturated fats, which are quite, and then they said, oh yeah. And then recently, because it became so popular, people started doing research on coconut fat and found out that coconut fat actually increases LDL cholesterol. So it's actually not good for, for the heart. And then they compared eating coconuts to eating coconut oil. And they found that the coconut, if you eat the coconut, you don't get the increase in LDL cholesterol only with the oil. And so they're thinking that it's the fiber in the coconut that prevents the damage that can be done by coconut oil. If you remove it from the fiber. It's interesting how a lot of food, like if we eat it raw or like the full part, it seems to have a very different effect than when we do a lot of weird things to the food and get something out and then suddenly something is missing. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know what? If life was invented, I mean, health was invented by life in nature. Hmm. So we can, and nature's mandate for how to eat for every creature, fresh, whole, raw, 
organic. And then local, seasonal, and maybe sun-dried, but you can also eat, uh, you can also eat gr green in an unripe thing. So that one is not as important for you. So that's the standard. And only human beings have decided that they knew better than nature's standard. And so we invent frying is the dumbest thing we ever invented to do to food. I say to people, listen, you got a frying pan? I know you have one. Go get it, turn it upside down, hit yourself on the head with it really hard. So it's associated with pain and then throw it up because from a health perspective, you're going to get a lot of pain from that frying pan if you continue to use it. Hmm. So what kind of food do you eat, Udo? I eat mostly plant-based whole broth. And I didn't always eat like that, but the older I get, the more it works for me. And what about I love bro I love broccoli. And I eat it with tahini, but I take pour off the sesame oil because that's only got omega sixes in it. Then I put up in my oil, which is omega three and six in the right ratio. <clears throat> and I dip the broccoli in mixture. So I be so I'm getting the seed, the oil, and the plant based all together. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things I do. But I eat lots of fruit. I eat mostly vegetables. I think we probably should be eating five times more green, five times more plants than fruit or vegetables than fruit. Because fruit, we can get at any time of year right now. But in nature, it was only seasonal, except in the tropics. Like Dominican Republic. Like the Dominic, yeah, Dominican Republic. But even in the Dominican Republic, if you look at how much it, greens there are in nature and how much fruit there is in nature, there's a lot more greens than fruit in nature. That might be a hint. I haven't met, so food is very much, feels like religion. Uh, many people claim they have the holy grail to how to make people more healthy. We have the vegan religion, the raw food religion, then you have the carnival religion that's like winning a lot of terrain these days with just only eating meat. Uh, you yeah. have the place and different religions seems to be showing different research results. The thing that I've found is that it seems to be different what works for different people. That we, the thing that most people can agree on is local uh, food that are fresh seems to be good. Most people except the carnivores agree that greens are good and mm. it's interesting to see how that kind of religion or going about like just only eating meat almost is getting so much attention these days and how people that have been on a vegan diet for many years got sick and then went to carnival right it's a tricky thing to see like what really works for everyone i think it is somewhat individual but one of the key mm -hmm. things is no processed food mm -hmm. no refined sugar and then really seeing like how your body reacts to it mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think to some extent, people can be different in what is the best diet for them. In a way, it's like religion. You, you talk about religions. The religion, my religion is, <clears throat> I want to understand the masters, but I don't want to understand them through somebody else's thought process. I want to understand it through my thought process because my understanding comes from my own processing. Hmm. Otherwise, I'm just memorizing somebody's stuff. And there's no power in that. Whether well, when it comes to food, it's like that too. Play with your food. If your mother told you when you were a kid, don't play with your food, that's the only advice she ever gave that you shouldn't ignore. Because if you don't play with your food and you try things out, how will you know what works for you? Yeah. By your own experience. And your body's always talking to you. So, so I, I mean, I, I can't argue with the guy who says, all I eat is meat and It, for some reason, it just works for me. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't work for me, but I'm not saying it doesn't work for, for that person. Hmm. Right? Now, the second thing is you have to also look at what are the beliefs behind the food religions? What are the individual beliefs be behind the guy who says meat? So who knows what's going on there from childhood? You know, what, whatever traumas and dramas got into making that work, right? And different things work for different people because of different beliefs as well. And if you say eating meat will make me sick and you really believe it, 
eating meat will make you sick. Yeah. Right. If you say, if you say eating vegetables will make me sick, if you believe it strong enough, you will make your stick when you eat vegetables. But it is a difficult topic because you can find research often arguing for different approaches. And I find, so I eat mostly a plant-based diet. I would love to go fully vegetarian. Something I think ethically about how we treat animals and so on and like eat yeah. them and so on that um, doesn't resonate with me. So like from a, what we say, higher perspective, I think we should go vegan or vegetarian. So that's one thing. But then it's like, what life am I living and what other life are other people living? And I find it uh, fascinating that I've met many people that were doing a, a, a vegan or vegetarian diet for many years. And then many people were sick and then they got better on that diet. And then after some years, suddenly it didn't work for them and they were starting to get sick despite eating uh, quite healthy. So like not vegetarian, eating chips and crappy food, right? But eating real food. And then some of them changed to a much more meat-based and suddenly were feeling better. I had one yeah. guy on, Chuck Hassan. He, I th he was a vegan for, and he was dominating ultra marathons and so on. For many years, him and his wife, and suddenly he got really sick. And there was really, they ended up changing to carnivore diet, I think it was, but it was also high quality meat. It was like grass fed out on the field and they're eating the entire thing, not only like part of the meat. And we were trying to, we we're learning that things that people did back in the days of eating nose to tail seems to be where a lot more of the nutrient actually is from animals, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a difficult subject. I would prefer just only to eat plants. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. <clears throat> if you live on the planet and you don't have gadgets and gadgets and you don't have a lot of choice because you're just depending on what's around you. <clears throat> if you, even if you ate only plant-based, you would probably have some worms in the leaves. Because if you look at, you know, if you look at tree leaves, there are clearly, you can see the little pathways that they put in. Well, if you're an animal and you're not thinking about it, you're just eating what you need to get your food, you're probably going to eat some of those little worms. That's an animal product. And the idea that we should be 100% vegan by nature, I'm not sure that that's in line with how nature put it together. No. Right? And then what happens is if you get really extreme. And you say, okay, nothing but plants and no, no honey because it's bee spit. So that's an animal product, right? We didn't have the, that kind of luxury when we were living survival to survival. And when you become extreme, you set yourself up for problems mm. on this side or on that side. Yeah. I haven't seen anybody who's done eat, eat nothing but meat for 30 years. So that whether that would be too, that would be too whether that would be too extreme too. That's what I'm curious about. Seeing the next ten yeah. years, these people that are now converting to it, like I would like to see the long term results. How exactly. they live in like 10, 20 years down. I very much believe, but that's my personal belief. I don't have the literature or the examples, but yeah. that it's mostly plant based, and then you have once in a while some quality uh, meat. With I don't eat red yeah. meat. I only eat uh, chicken and fish. But I believe that a little bit of uh, a high quality is probably good for you. And then I'm becoming yeah. more curious about how people are eating organs and how there's so much mm -hmm. nutrition in different organs where we would right. often eat like the part of the meat that doesn't give us the most nutrition. Uh, but that's become like, um, when we say higher culture, where we've been taught that's the quality, but where the real quality is in like that, that we see in the Western world as lower quality yeah. part of the animal, right? Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's something I'm curious to follow the next 10 years. I'm not jumping on that wagon yet, both because I'm doing well without. So the only reason I should go to pure meat would really be if my right. health was suffering so much and I tried everything else. Yeah. So, but so, jumping back to oils. Yeah. What are the good oils? Well, omega-3 and omega-6, the richest source of omega-3 is flaxseed oil. And what I happened to me when I got, <clears throat> when I got poisoned. I started reading the literature. Then we found out omega-3s are an essential nutrient. And 99% of the population doesn't get enough. And there's a ratio that works somewhere between 2 to 1 in favor of omega-3s to 4 to 1 in favor of omega-6. That's a range of ratios between those two that works. But most people are getting 10 to 1 in favor of omega-6, even 20 or 50 to 1. And there are virtually no omega-3s. 
Now, omega-3s, one of the things that's really interesting is they inhibit cytokine storms, which you may have heard about cytokine storms because the cytokines that cause the storms are made out of omega-6s. And it would make sense that if you don't have any omega-3s in your diet, you would have more problems with cytokine storms than if you have, if you have either more omega-3 in your diet or you have a better balance. Mm. Right. So I put the uh, flax seeds in my smoothies. Yeah. Blend them. Yep. So that would be a good thing because they're Perfect. getting Absolutely. everything from the flax seed. I've also heard that you need to blend them or like uh, you need to. Yeah. Because, yeah, because if you eat flax seeds, they have a very thick cover. It's like quite leathery. And if you eat the seeds and you don't chew them and you don't break them, they will literally go through you and you can plant them and they will still grow. Yeah. <laughs> I, and that's because the, the, they have a mucilage fiber on the outside. You get the benefit of that. So they're good for bowel regularity and stuff like that. But if you want the nutrients, the omega-3s and the minerals and the vitamins and the, the lignans they contain, then you have to break the seed. Yeah. Just like you would have to do with anything that you chew it. And the idea of chewing it is you break it so that your digestive system can break it down and isolate, take out the nutrients and then absorb those nutrients. Yeah. So yeah, it's always better to, and flax particular, because when you chew it, it's not as easy to chew as many other seeds, partly because it's so small and it sticks between your teeth, right? And partly because it's, it's gooey because yeah. it has this gooey fiber on it. So blending them. <clears throat> Or getting it as an oil, highly recommendable. Yeah. Yeah. And frankly, use the seed. And the way we measure optimum intake of oil is by what your skin feels. If your skin is dry, you need more oil because your skin gets them last and loses them first. And your inner organs get priority on the essential fatty acids. You can live with dry skin, but if your heart dried out, that wouldn't work for you. So right. would you say skin issues such as psoriasis and eczema is potentially related to not getting the right uh, amount of omega-3? I, I wouldn't say it that way, but I could say it this way, that when people with eczema start taking enough, and, and we usually, in this case, we're using the oil <clears throat> because I can't get enough oil from just eating the seeds. I actually tested that on myself. Even in summer, when I need less oil than in winter, I use basically four tablespoons in summer and two or three, uh, sorry, uh, two or three in summer and four in winter. Even in summer, when I need less oil, I couldn't get my skin from getting drier in California. That's where I was at the time. <clears throat> and so, so fundamentally we're saying what, so when we use it in eczema and psoriasis, we get results consistently. I think the reason for it is not so much on, not so much about the oil being anti psoriasis, but psoriasis and eczema have you get dry skin and then it seeps and then bacteria start eating it. So a lot of eczema and psoriasis infection on the skin from bacteria that like, like it when it's wet and when there's no oil to protect you. And when you put the oil in, you form a barrier in the skin against the loss of moisture and that helps, but you can also do it with acid water because that'll kill the bacteria. So, so, but the oil consistently, they get, we get results. If the oil doesn't do it completely, then what I would do is, is use acid water to kill the bacteria. Got it. I spoke to one woman <clears throat> without going into uh, a long, who uh, works with the uh, acidic and alkaline water. Yeah. She very much recommends like the acidic water for skin issues. Also because yeah. the skin's natural pH value, is it like 5.5 or something? Yeah, it's about, yeah, yeah, five or six. Yeah. yeah. And our water, at least in Denmark is, uh, is it, I think seven and a half. It's supposed to be seven in North America. I don't know what they did in, it's because they're trying to make it neutral. Yeah. Seven. But the, when I talk about acid water, I'm talking about pH 2.5, okay. which also comes out of, which also comes out of a, a water machine that's, that electrolyzes the water and separates alkaline water from acidic water. Yeah. Yeah. And then you do that, you put that water on there consistently for 
maybe two weeks, yeah. maybe three times a day. Then you keep killing the infection. And I've seen people get, did not use oil at all, just use water to get that effect. Yeah. Salt water so. is also really good for the skin. Salt water is, yeah, salt water is okay. It, depending on how strong the salt is, <clears throat> it, it's not as good as killing the bacteria. It might stop them, but not necessarily kill them. Yeah. So I think the acid water is more effective, yeah. but that's, I don't know everything about that, but that's my experience. What are some other really good sources of omega-3 that you recommend? Well, omega-3, five, <clears throat> flax, chia seeds, there's a shizo. The shizo seeds, the shizo is, is a leaf that's used in uh, sushi. And there's a little bit in other oils, a little bit in soybean oil, a little bit in canola oil, a little bit in walnut. Canola uh, oil, I think is one of the things that I heard has been demonized for uh, cooking. What's, yeah. Yeah. It's demonized. It de it's demonized partly because there's all kinds of stuff on the internet that is not really true. That says like people without foundation making clever assumptions, sometimes very logical assumptions. But if the foundation is wrong, then the, then what you build on it is going to be wrong too. Yeah. Canola is maybe a little bit worse, a little bit worse than most oils because it has more omega threes and omega threes are five times more sensitive to damage. The canola oil has about, uh, 10% omega three. 24% omega-6. Walnut has like maybe 7 to 11. Soybean, 7 to 9. What about avocado oil? Avocado has is about 5%. The oil is about 5% omega-3. Yeah. Um, but, oh yeah, and hemp oil is 57% uh, omega-6 and about 19% omega-3. Yeah, so, so there are, so you, so in order to get the ratio right, you got to do something that adds flax oil or chia seed oil. A chia seed, there's some fraud stuff that somebody put together. So there's a lot of stories about chia seed oil, about how good it is. But the guy who did the research cre had a patent <laughs> on chia seed oil. And so he did the research that made chia seed oil look good. Flax seed oil is probably a better oil from, for a number of reasons. But so that. Nobody chia, cheated on it. Chia seeds uh, would also be good to eat for example, making a chia pudding or something else. So you get uh, the omega-3 from that. Yeah, you get the omega-3s from it. And then you get, uh, you get lots of mucilage fiber too. Yeah. Like flax has that too. But flax has some other ingredients like the, the lignans. Flax is a very rich source of that. And lignans, it's the richest source, about a hundred times more than any other source. And the lignans are, I mean, there's a long list of what they're, what they protect you from. Yeah. And so what about flax? Diabetes and lupus. Hmm? I, I heard there's a limit for how many or how much flaxseed you should eat a day. Is that a, a myth or is there like something, a certain amount is good for you? And then no, I think there's like a balance. Yeah. There is in flaxseed is there's, there's cyanogenic glucosides and under certain situations, they can turn into cyanic acid and hydrogen cyanide is, is a poison. But if you figure out how much is in the flax and all of it turned into hydrogen cyanide, when you ate it, you would have to eat three kilograms or two kilograms, I think of flax. And that flax that you eat will swell to six times its size because of the mucilage. So now, and that would be, you'd have to do that every day. So two, two kilograms. So you'd basically have to take, uh, six times two, 12, basically you'd have to have 12 kilograms of flaxseed. So the, and, and, but there was, when that was first found, there was a lot of, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. But you know, you get cyanide in, in apple seeds and pear seeds and in, in bitter almonds and in peach seeds, apricot seeds. That's what they called laetrile, uh, which was used as an anti-cancer agent with not a lot of foundation behind it. Hmm. 
But, but the idea that you can eat so much flaxseed oil that it'll kill you, that's like, no, I don't think so. No, no there are deer that have died eating flax, the flax plant, but they were eating the greens, not the seeds. Because flax has cyanogenic, cyanogenic glucosides in it, and it makes it for its own protection. Because yep. flax seeds purpose is not to be eaten by a deer, <laughs> but to perpetuate itself, right? And different plants have different ways of protecting themselves. And that's one of the reasons uh, a guy like Dave Asprey is suddenly starting to go very hard on many plants. For example, kill, he calls it killer kill. Um, if you don't uh, boil it or steam it, same with broccoli and other things that have these protection mechanisms in the plant that can create some challenges, right? Wow. That's the story. Yeah. I eat it raw all the time. Yeah. And I, I eat kale too, but I don't eat as much kale as I eat broccoli. I eat tons of broccoli. Yeah. Every day. <clears throat> no, I don't, I don't buy it. And then of course, if you look at what people do is they demonize something. And in behind it, they bring in the thing that they're trying to promote, right? So Udo, where do we find most of the research for some of the claims that we've been talking about today? Oh, so God. I always love when people are challenging their common narrative. Yeah. I think with the bigger claims you come with that are against the common narrative, um, the stronger the amount of everything you need to provide to convince people. Because as you said, otherwise everyone can come with uh, good narratives and convincing stories. Right. But some of the science is a, is good narrative and stories too. Yes. And so that's, so it's not as easy as say, hey, let's just follow the science. Science is being misused unbelievably a lot these days because there's so much money to be made on the stories. And then you call it science. And then some people say, well, now we're into scientism, which is a religion, which is when somebody says, well, I'm the science or I know the science or I follow the science. And then you assume that because he said that, is that what they're saying is true. <laughs> so, so what does someone listening and be like, okay, how the hell is, should I know yeah. who to believe? Like this Udo guy, he seems really nice. He yeah, yeah. Uh, has I, a good story and that, but this other guy also has some really good stories and also seems very credible. How do they, yeah. uh, how do we help them? Well, I know it's tough. It, it is, it's tough. I wish I could just point you in some direction and say, now there's the truth. So help me God. Yeah. I can't do that. I can't do that. A lot of what I've learned is from my own experience and more based on principle than on research. And, and why is that? Because if you understand how carbon works and you don't understand how hydrogen works and you understand how oxygen works. And you understand what fat mo molecules are capable of if they have double bonds in them or they don't have double bonds. If you, so if you start to look at all of that, I have made predictions about omega threes that were not in the research, but if it's almost, it's almost like I was so obsessed with them. I was thinking like the molecules that sounds, sounds, sounds a little, that sounds a little crazy. But one of the things people say, oh, alpha linolenic acid, the omega-3 has three double bonds in it. Double bonds make molecules more sensitive to reactions. Oh my God, if you eat flax oil, then it's going to go rancid in your body and it's going to hurt you. And this guy came up with it, guy, a guy in the natural foods trade. And I looked at that and I said, I get the logic. He doesn't have the background. I get the logic. They are sensitive. But what we're seeing in practice is that they actually act like antioxidants instead of pro-oxidants. They actually protect you from rancidity. And that was about 10 years later, they showed that alpha linolenic acid turns into EPA and DHA and a whole bunch of other things. And then EPA and DHA turn into certain hormones called eicosanoids and the DHA turns is used in the brain and DHA turns into protectants, which are very powerful antioxidants made from omega-3 molecules. So you have an omega-3 molecule that is really sensitive and you have enzymes that turn this really sensitive molecule into a molecule that protects 
that sensitive omega-3 molecule. So those are called protectants. And then another one, resolvents, very powerful anti-inflammatories made from omega-3s. And, and, and so, so I predicted that they actually protect your body because we weren't getting any results with people where they acted like oxidants, where they, where they acted to, to damage the tissue, oxidize the tissue. And, and I predicted that just on the basis of observations, science is based on observation. You don't need a, an institution behind observation. You need a pair of eyes and a calmness so that you're just looking at what's going on without another agenda. And where the issue, where the, pro, like, like in Ayurvedic medicine, there was not a single double blind placebo controlled study until maybe 20, 30, 50 years ago. And they, and the, that way of dealing with disease is like 20,000 years old. And they have amazing documentation for what works, but not on bl double blind placebo controlled study, but what a, an a Ayurvedic physician needs to do that is part of his training or her training. They need to be able to sit down, get still, bring their awareness inward to the peace, to the contentment, to the wholeness, to the unconditional love that is our most basic state of being. And they don't have any head trips going on in that place. And then when somebody comes to them, they could observe what was going on and not get it mixed up with their own head trip. Well, if you can't get out of your own head trip, you, your diagnosis will get mixed up. The, the patient's diagnosis will get mixed up with your own stuff. So then you're not as good as making a, a diagnosis because the diagnosis is based on observation, right? Science is based on observation. <clears throat> if you can observe without agenda, you will find truth. Whether you're talking about in terms of truth about your own being, like through meditation or some kind of a stillness practice, self-knowledge or something, right? And then you observe. You, when you go to the doctor, he depends on your observation. So Say, well, the, the, uh, to distill it, also because yeah. time is running. Yeah. What you're saying is for the listener being out there confused, being like, Udo sounds like a nice person. He's yeah. saying something good. This other person like Dave Asprey also seems like a nice person. He's saying all this stuff. This third person is saying this. Yeah. Way to navigate this, uh, all the noise and figuring out what is true. Yeah. This is what you, what I'm hearing you say in the end is uh, test it out for yourself. Get stillness so you can feel for yourself what is working. Yep. Yep. Is that, can we distill it to that? Yep, absolutely. Try it out. See what your body tells you. Yeah. But pay attention. Don't go in there with a head full of ideas. Yeah. Yeah, because that's what we also need to get back into, back to, in the way we live in the world and in the way we do science. Yeah. And when, we're, when we don't do that, we make huge mistakes. Yeah. This is yeah. also no, kind of I, I, but I'll tell you one other thing because I don't want to just diss the science. Probably in the last 20 years, maybe 30 years, science has become very much more money oriented. If you go back uh, before that and you look at the science before that, the basic science, when they were excited about, oh my God, I didn't know that. Oh my God, they turn into hormones. Oh my God, they regulate, uh, gene activity on a moment to moment basis in our cells. When you read that basic stuff, then you could, then that gives you a foundation you can build on. That's not an easy thing to do because there's a lot of research out there. Yeah. And it's impossible to follow all of it. That's also why I try to get yeah. podcast guests on. And again, yeah. there's like, I see this, you can understand something from a principal perspective or like a biological yeah. perspective. If you argue yeah. for that, this does this and this does this. Yeah. Um, that's one way to kind of understand something in, in the noise. Uh, you can look at it from a studies perspective, but often yeah. there is, um, studies saying different things. And yeah. then you got to look at like what's sponsored from what. Yeah. And there's a lot of things, especially natural things that simply just don't have the, the backing to do these studies because it's super expensive and there's right. no, uh, no yep. financial interest behind it. So there's so many right. amazing natural remedies to help us, but yeah. there's no money behind it. Right. Yeah. And then the statistics are on yourself to see like what feels right. 
Yeah. Uh, well, fundamentally, your expert is called life. Yeah. Inside you running the whole show, everything. <clears throat> Ask that expert, try things out. What does it work like? If, if you eat something and somebody told you it's really good for you and you have diarrhea for three days, may, it may just not be true for you. And ultimately, it's always only what's true for what's true for me that I need to understand. Yeah. Be because I can't assume that your biochemistry is 100% the same as mine. But I know that my biochemistry is 100% the same as mine. Yeah. Right? And that's why experience is a great teacher. Now, obviously, you don't want to take risks to kill you, right? But it, when it comes to food, you try things out. The guy who's saying this, this, whole this meat diet it's the best thing that ever try it out because it may be true for that person but may not be true for you yeah or it may be true for that person and it's also true for you i know it's not true for me yeah i really know that because i play with it all the time i'm always trying stuff out and ultimately i may not have the world's answer but i have my body's answer and when it comes to the things that are personal to me my body's answer or life's answer within me is my actually more reliable than the science because mm. the science is done in certain ways and I'm not. They control certain variables and set it up in a laboratory. Well, I'm not a laboratory. That's why we always want to talk about biohacking. We talk about N equals one. So you want to look at that. I'm an N of one study. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So and every one of us is. Yeah, so you figure that out and of course you look at like what are the like what are studies pointing towards and you might start with that, but you know they're outliers and you might not be the one where it's working from and see other circumstances, right? So right. that's really uh, testing it out. So and I, what, I, what, I, what I find really interesting is you have the keto diet, which is like you use fats as your fuel and then you have the carb diets. And there are people who absolutely swear that the carb diet is the best diet and they're up. People who absolutely swear that the keto diet is the best diet. And you have to define exactly what they mean by that. Hmm. I can tell you this, I do better on a keto, keto based diet. I don't do well on, on a high carb diet, even if they're not white sugar, white flour diets, <clears throat> but lentils and chickpeas and all of that. I don't, I do better on, on a higher fat, lower carb diets. Yeah. And that's like, and I look at it and say, like, is it, do people have like that distinct biochemistry that they can swear by it? And they, and then of course, when you swear by one, you see all the research that promote, that supports you. And when you swear by the other, you see all the research that supports you mm. and you may not actually see the research that doesn't support you because no. you already got your mind made up. Yeah. Udo, so, time yeah. running. Yeah. Uh, I always want to ask in the end two things. First of all, where people can find more, uh, find yeah. out more about you. And then afterwards, like finishing off with three advice you would give about living a happy, healthy, meaningful life. Doesn't have to relate, be related to, uh, mm -hmm. to orals. So let's yeah. start with like, where can people find out more about you? Okay. Easiest way, Udo's choice, U-D-O-S choice.com. And I talked about, the, I'll put that in the show notes. Yeah. Udo's choice.com. And I talk about actually oils, enzymes, probiotics, because I work with those as well. And that's probably the, that's probably the best place to go for, we talk about the oil and how we make the oil and why we make it and all of that. It's quite a bit of good stuff on it. Fantastic. <coughs> and if yeah. you have to give three short advice for the listeners about how to live a happy, healthy, meaningful life, I'll make it into a social media post as well. What would that be? Happy, healthy. And meaningful life. Meaningful. Okay. The meaning of life is embedded in the experience of it. <clears throat> in order to have that experience, you need to sit still every day and learn to bring your awareness inside just to feel what it feels like to be alive. And the meaning comes from that. It's also very good for health. And what was the third part? Happy. Oh, happy. So, oh yeah. And happiness is a state of being. It, there's happiness that's dependent on things, conditional happiness. I'll be happy when you love me. Well, anytime you don't love me, I'm not happy. So that's conditional. What if I, what if I'm happy because it's in me to be happy because it's a state of being. And why don't I just go there and be happy whether you like me or not? Okay. <clears throat> Most of what you're talking about in terms of meaning and happiness and, and health, 
the most neglected part of all of that is our willingness to bring our awareness inside into this, into the space our body occupies and discover what's there in terms of energy and awareness. That's where all of that, that's where all those questions are ultimately answered. But the other way to say it is the more close you closely, you live in line with nature and your nature, the more you're going to be happy, healthy, and meaningful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Rudolf, thank you so much for, uh, for joining the podcast. All right. Thank you. It.